so you'll get a request to okay me recording it. Make it not to meet her tomorrow. Welcome all to this evening's book club on The Mistress of Longing by Wendy Hazlera Cherry. We are really, really excited to have her here with us all the way from over across the States. And Wendy, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming, Mary. It's so beautiful to see you. Um, and it's so lovely to be to be gathered in this little um, intimate group with you. So um, my name is Wendy Havel Cherry, and I live in um, Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, when I wrote the book, when I channeled the book with the mistress, I lived in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And um, I was also uh, married and um, I am no longer in that relationship, at least not in that way. It's a little more complicated than that, um, but I'll, I'll leave it at that um, for now. Um, we can certainly go into more of that and I'm sure we will um, as uh, we talk about what happens when someone like the mistress of longing comes into your life. Um, let's see, I am a shamanic practitioner and I came into my role as a shamanic practitioner really by way of being a, hi there, welcome, um, by way of being a contemplative psychotherapist. And I was a therapist for many years working with women and children um, while also navigating my spiritual life and my role as a medium and a poet and uh, until it all just became very obvious that it was time for it to sort of um, roll into a more uh, conducive, um, sort of unified stance, if you will, versus spreading myself out so thin in all of these different directions. Um, Let's see, what else can I say about myself? I have one other book. It's a book of poetry. It's called The Reach is Holy. Um, and I'm probably leaving out really obvious things. And and I, I'm not sure. How is that, Lucy? That's a fabulous <laughs> introduction. Thank you. <laughs> so Wendy got in contact with me in one of those. Her book is one of those ones that slipped through my rules and slipped through my, my boundaries of, we're too busy, we're too full. And it came and it whacked me through the heart and I got straight back to her. I'd say within 24, maybe 48 hours. And we had a call very quickly after that where we both were in tears. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just a real meeting of souls through this manuscript that she sent me. And so we were full and I shouldn't have taken on anything else. And yet I had to, I, I felt absolutely contracted to the soul of the book and Wendy saw that it had come through. So I also broke another rule, which is I've never written a, an introduction to anybody's book before. We usually try and, and have someone from outside of our little circle to do that. But I wrote the foreword for Wendy's book, which I'd really like to read now because it tells you how the book hit me and why I needed to publish it. As a publisher, I work in service to our authors, which is so lovely to have three, two authors and, and a nearly hopefully maybe author here. <laughs> um, as, I, as a publisher, I work in service to our authors, a creative source, their joint creation and the world, facilitating connection between them. In the course of this work, there are magical moments when a book comes along with such a strong life of its own that it is quivering. This is such a book, deceptively small. It contains real magic. When I first read the manuscript to The Mistress of Longing, I realized that I had entered a process, or rather the process had entered me. The soul of the work, its cover, the way it needed to be shared, the 
those we needed to approach for enforcement all appeared in my mind's eye. All that was required from me was to trust the process and say yes. I get this experience to some degree with the majority of our books. With The Mistress of Longing, it was incredible, like plugging directly into source. Our first author publisher call was unusual, to say the least. There was no doubt to either of us that The Mistress of Longing was in attendance and had enabled the whole process. Our conversation started with the words, you're beautiful, and continued quickly into mutual tears of a shared heart connection. As an author, my personal fascination is in giving voice to lost archetypes of the feminine. I am so deeply grateful to Wendy for introducing me to an archetype of the feminine that has always been there, but remained nameless. Allowing the voice of the mistress of longing to come through her is a profound act of service. What I need to tell you is that the mistress of longing is true and real. She is not made up. You do not need to believe in her. When you open this book, you open a portal to a direct energetic transmission. Can you let your heart and mind receive this possibility? Simply allow the words on the page to begin your remembering. Take a deep breath in. Wouldn't do that if you stayed in on purpose. The mistress of longing is here for you, throwing rose petals at your feet in blessing. Wendy, tell us how the mistress found you. Well, first, I just have to say all my tears are coming back. Just I've, of course, read your words and I've never heard you or watched you speak them. And so I'm just receiving that and I feel very honored. Um, and I also find it interesting that the mistress seems to be a rule breaker. Um, <laughs> I just, it really hit me as you were speaking of, oh yes, like that, absolutely. She's a revolutionary and um, a that, rule To kick back into where we were little, having a little chat before we started is perhaps why people find her so tricky why she's so difficult to work with, why they're not willing to kind of engage with her necessarily to begin with because of that. She's a rule breaker. She doesn't respect boundaries, rules. That's right. That's she's right. not safe. She's not safe. That's right. <laughs> That's right. It's not all uh, sweetness and rose petals. There are thorns in, on the rose as well and um, big initiation and um, I was sharing with Lucy right before the call that um, what I have found in my experience is that often um, it seems to me that people want to talk about longing about as much as they want to talk about death and defecation. Mm -hmm. Because it's not easy. It's not just this beautiful poetic thing. It is very beautiful. And it also is so much else. So the mistress of longing came to me. Um, well, she came to me in the middle of the night and um, she came to me in the dream time and she um, introduced herself to me by chanting a poem over me over and over and over again. And this did not stop. And it was a night that I was sleeping really hard. And yet this was, this kept coming and coming. And she was quite persistent. Again, a rule breaker, no boundaries. Um, she kept going with it until I got up out of bed, padded down the stairs and went to my little iPad and with squinted eyes typed, typed out what I had been hearing over and over and over again. And um, I, I remember looking, sort of pulling away from the screen and looking back at it and thinking, whoa, what is this? And um, that is how she came to me in the middle of the night. That's how it all began. 
And had you ever had an experience like that before? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Because I something that is also true is that, which is appears at, at the beginning of the book, is also a little um, poem that was received to me by all I knew that the author of the poem was a butter lamp. And that poem came to me in the same way, in the middle of the night. Uh, it came forward on the spring equinox in March, and the mistress came forward in September. And I believe that the mistress was introducing herself to me, actually, through the butter lamp initially. And um, that was the first time that I received something completely intact. I had over the years received some poetry, lines of poetry, things like that um, in the dream time, um, but nothing ever like this that I knew wholeheartedly was something being channeled and transmitted through me and not me at all. And did you recognize the mistress of longing from anything previous in your life? Have you, do you, did you, had you seen her in art or recognized her in film or fiction or in a person in your life? Was there any kind of precursors to her that allowed you to envisage who she was, what she was called, how, how, how she was appearing? Or was she completely fresh and new and, and unknown to you? On some level, she was completely fresh and new and unknown to me. I had never seen, experienced um, anything like the essence of her. Um, and the more time I've spent with her, it's clear to me that I've known her all along, but I didn't, you know, I didn't, I also did not know her when she came, if that makes any sense. Do you have a picture of her in your mind? Did I or do I? Do you? Do you, mm. do you see her visually? Do you, do you have a sense of, of her visually? I feel her and I hear her. Um, uh, much more than I see her. When I do see her, I actually do see her often as some sort of form um, uh, that looks very similar to the cover of the book, actually. Um, but I often just hear her and feel her. And she comes through um, visually um, with red and, and gold and fire and, um, and passion. And how did you know you could trust her? Hmm. I just knew. I just knew it was one of those things that no intellect could could ever possibly describe, nor can I now. I just simply know. Mm. And has she, how has she shaped your life? Obviously, the book emerged. Mm -hmm. How has she continued to, to work through you? Well, um, she actually has changed my life quite a lot um, and has liberated um, aspects of myself and parts of me that, that I knew were inside me all along, but would not give myself permission to really even sort of go there, if you will. Um, Interestingly, the the week that um, The Mistress of Longing was uh, published, I was in Costa Rica. I was at a woman's retreat. And um, um, I had had several experiences with the mistress there, one of which was um, uh, very profound. And she kept showing up everywhere. And um, it became very apparent to me that um, I was sort of being dressed in something new and that was happening from the inside out. And um, 
I have had been very happily married to a beautiful man um, and in relationship with him for 20 years. And yet I had always had the desire to be with a woman and um, had um, experimented a little bit actually um, when I was younger and with my sexuality and really just sort of suppressed it. I, I met this wonderful man and, you know, life went on and we got married and um, we're still actually very close to this day. Um, but while I was in Costa Rica, I knew that I was not going back to my marriage the way it was. And I knew that I was going to be giving myself permission to, um, seek a relationship with a woman. And I was opening myself up to that. And I had no idea what that was going to look like, how that was going to unfold. I just knew that once I landed in Santa Fe, everything was going to be very different. And indeed it was. And um, it was only a few months later that I declared my love for a woman to a woman And about a month after that, that I left Santa Fe and moved to Asheville. And I am in Asheville now, and I'm still very much in love with that woman. (laughs) And, um, And I am also navigating what it's like to not be... Uh, living a life that is super traditional, um, still being in relationship with this man who has been my husband for so long, but in a very different way and um, trying to be very conscientious about that. And um, she has definitely shifted my... um, capacity and sort of, I would even say sort of like my wingspan capacity of being able to be open to love. And um, again, I don't mean that in a unicorn bubblegum kind of way. I mean, in a, what can be a very heart-wrenching way. Um, So she shifted my life quite a lot. The whole way I've identified myself and related to the world has shifted. Um, It's been quite an initiation. Thank you so much for sharing so openly with us. Um, I was aware of kind of stuff unfolding for you. Obviously, I was, you know, kind of on the other side of the ocean, but I just, I hold in such deep respect the space that you gave for that truth mm. that you needed to live out to unfold at such a such a vulnerable time, putting putting your creative work out there and allowing your your yourself to be initiated through life. It's, and it's not unusual, is the other thing that I can say. Like we, we've had a couple of authors experience that first book goes out into the world, this huge kind of psychic psychological shift happens energetic shift happens and everything else starts to shift around them and the life that they had before the book suddenly isn't the life they have afterwards and you never know which way it's going to go which way it's going to fall but it's it's always exciting and terrifying to watch it happen to two people because because there is such a trusting that is required in that that moment of birthing this book out into the world and saying yes to other shifts that happen around it. Um, I think there's a reason why putting your voice out into the world, putting your deepest truth out into the world, putting your soul out into the world is such a big deal because Mm. you are saying yes to something which you don't know what it is. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Did you have any sense when you were writing it that this might be the case, that that this was the mistress's purpose in, in your, in your psyche, in your soul? Did you have any inkling or, or did it take 
the creating the book is one thing, the birthing the book is the next thing, and then it's unfolded after that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Such a great question. Well, I felt as though she was really introducing me to my true self. Um, and um, definitely um, inviting me into a, a much bigger landscape than anything that I had known and was inviting me into mystery. And what was very interesting, I mean, not only was it changing my my personal life in, in, in such a way, but the actual writing of the book was her helping me step into my role um, as, as a medium, really. Mm -hmm. And whereas I had only sort of, I didn't really believe that was true about myself before that. Um, and so there was really this there was a way in which I was moving through that threshold and I didn't really know it exactly how that was happening, except that I, I did know it in the way that I was utterly devoted, utterly devoted to the process. And I, before I started writing the, the actual manuscript, I sat down for 50 days and just said, okay, tell me and started getting to know her and I would ask her questions and she would answer and she would ask me questions and have me answer. And, and then I just sort of waited for her to say, all right, you're ready, begin. Mm -hmm. And when she did, that's what happened. And, and the book was written quite quickly. So I have a, a question for you, which, which, it's back into that mediumship piece and also dips into the fact, if I'm right, you study or have studied with Dr. Carissa Pinkola Estes. Yes. And so have dived deep into the world of archetypes. Yes. So do you have, I call Mistress of Longing an archetype because that's how she comes across to me and that's how I have perceived her. But to you, is there a sense of her being a spirit of some sort that you have used your medium powers for? Or if, if she is archetypal for you? And, and if so, kind of, are there any kind of archetypal stories that you kind of know her from? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that question. Um, well, as a shamanic practitioner, I um, really relate to her very much as a helping spirit. And um, I have many, many helping spirits that I work with and I have a, a, a tight little group um, that are sort of always with me and she is one of them. And so I very much relate to her as a helping spirit that I can go to anytime and um, receive assistance from. Um, and I, I also can see and relate to her as an archetype because of my background and because of my studies and because I think that she too actually um, wants us to be able to relate to her and any other um, sort of energy or essence in that way so that we have a template to be able to sort of, you know, um, Dr. E, as Clarissa Pinkola Estes likes to refer to herself, would say about a, about a good story. She would say, um, allow yourself to lie down next to the bones of the story so that your bones and the bones of the story can lie side by side and begin to relate to each other. And so even just that, I've just named several archetypes, right? Um, and so it feels that, that way so much um, for me with the mistress that she, um, 
I engage with her as this helping spirit, and she's also in several archetypes. And um, yeah. Thank you. I just, I know we've got a few um, Dr. E fans here, so I just thought it would be interesting to see, to see what, what wisdom you have to share via her as well. Thank you. Yeah. Is there a piece that you would like to read from it? I would love personally for you to read the Mistress of Longing poem because I've never heard it in your voice and that would be magical. But if there's another piece you'd like to read as well. Hmm. Well, you know, what I often like to do with the book is um, open it to a random page because I feel like the book um, can be read that way as a sort of oracle but I'll share with you that last night I, I invited her into the dream time with me and just said is there is there anything in particular that you would like for me to speak to specifically tomorrow with um, whoever shows up and um, she really talked to me a lot about the energy of, of longing simply as longing, of just to experience it as that. Um, and that it's very much the same as, as this passage that, that, that I'm about to read. So I'll just read it and, and we'll go from there. A few years ago, while I was working at a residential treatment center, I began to understand the sanity of addiction. At its core is longing, which is our natural state. Addiction, the way I have experienced it, both in my own life and with those I have worked with and those I love, is a pattern of repetitive actions that are harmful to our essence. And yet, we reach for them because they bring some sense of relief. It is my belief that desiring relief is a whole and holy desire. While facilitating mindfulness and storytelling groups, I saw over and over again how this reach itself is the medicine. What we are reaching for isn't always the best option but the reach itself is an intrinsic knowing to belong to safety, nourishment, and a clear, strong, enduring center. I found that I began telling my clients that their reach was a whole and holy action towards something that exists underneath what they were actually reaching for. Underneath the alcohol, drugs, or sex addiction was the desire to feel safe, at home, and at ease. The Dalai Lama has said that we all want the same thing. We all want to be happy. We all want to experience less suffering and more ease. We are born fresh, out of our warm and cozy mother cave, and into the stark, cold, harsh light with the longing to feel less discomfort and get to safety. The mistress of longing wants to tell us that she is right here, available to and for us. She desires to lead us to our belonging and that which will help us experience the truth of who we already are. There is radiance in your longing. Inside the longing is vast potential, life force, healing, sexual energy, sensuality, intelligence, creativity, wisdom, love, and compassion. In the first two lines of the poem, the mistress of longing introduces herself to us and also tells us that she's been here all along. 
When we feel vulnerable and unsafe, she is there. When we feel comfort and at home with life, she is there too. So there's something just about that not having to figure out what the longing is actually reaching for, but just giving ourselves permission to go back to that essence because it is it is who we are, um, at least as I understand it and the way that the mistress explains it um, to me. I just, when I, I read the book for the first time and hearing you read it again, I just experienced a sense of great compassion listening to those words because people who struggle with addiction tend to be met with the opposite of compassion. They get to be met with shame and with judgment. And to, to hear those words of deep compassion, that you are not broken, there is nothing wrong with you, there is something holy in this longing and something good and right in this longing, it's just the thing that you're feeding it with isn't the thing that you're really longing for. It is a very compassionate and true and real message to give to people. I think it gives you something to, to hold on to, something to move off from rather than feeling isolated and alone. Instead, you feel met in that. And that, that is very powerful. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it was really beautiful to have the experience of being able to um, meet people in that way. And, and, and it's been very interesting to do some work um, specifically with the Mistress of Longing in shamanic healing work that I do with others. And sometimes she comes through in this way. Um, as very motherly mm -hmm. and very tender and deeply compassionate. Um, I've, I've had women say that they have never felt held um, the way they do when they're with the mistress. Um, so and I think also the, she, she unites the paradox that the West, Western minds can't get about women about femininity which is this nurturing mothering nature as well as this sexual passionate nature both coexisting in this this archetype this this mistress of longing I think is is done very very well because it shows us yes we can hold all of those facets within oneself mm. oh, yes yes it yes, solves yes. the riddle of the mother and the whore yeah, truly. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saying that. I agree wholeheartedly. Would you read us the mistress's poem? Of course. There was a time when I did not have to look um, at the words, um, but it's been a little while. So I, I want to make sure that I do it just. I can't do it with any of my work. I have tried. I've, <laughs> I've stood and tried. And once I did it on an interview and I literally, the interviewer was reading it along with me and I was like, da, da, da. I was able to do some of it and then she would carry on and then I was able to join in again. <laughs> when it comes through you, it doesn't mean that it sticks with you word for right. word. Right, exactly, exactly. Okay, good. I'm glad I'm not alone there. <laughs> no. Okay. Hmm. I am the mistress of longing with you since the beginning. I am the invitation and your hands opening the envelope. Longing brought you here, births you again and again. I am the impulse to live, the threshold of each new breath, the key that unlocks your vision. 
I am the unfolding of desire, soft opening. When you close your eyes, filled with ecstasy, I enter. I am the wind breath that pinkens your soul. Leave rose petals at the gate. I will come. Thank you. That line, the wind breath that pinkens your soul is one of my favorite all time lines of anything I have ever read in my life. It just, mm. yeah. Yeah, it's so descriptive. It's so, mm. um, yes, she's quite poetic. Mm. Yeah. Well, I would like to open the floor to anybody who might have a question for Wendy. And there is no obligation, there is no pressure, just an invitation. Yeah, please, AJ, thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm AJ. Um, I apologize uh, if this question is answered in the book. Uh, Life has been crazy and I haven't had a chance to read yet, but it's on my list. I promise like it's in my, it's on my phone. Um, when like the mistress of longing is in your life, do you ever feel like she is fulfilled or like you are fulfilled or like you're walking alongside each other? Just like with the way that poem was written, it just feels like that moment, like for me, when I'm dancing, it's just like, oh, like you said, like that when you close your eyes and the mistress of learning, like she enters, I was like, oh yeah. Cause when you're just like, this is what I've been longing for. This is what I've been craving. This is like what I was made for. Right. Um, do you feel like you have that? Like you walk alongside each other or then like she enters and then like, she's like, okay, and here, now here's where we're moving and like move together or you follow, or is it like threads or what does that look like? Or does she have like a sibling, like Ashen woman, burning woman, like does Mr. Sublonging have like another facet of her that works with her? Yeah, or like how does it show up for you personally? That's like five questions, but I'm super excited to read this book and I'm really glad this came up on my phone just now. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much for all of that. Truly. Um I wanna I want to say that it's it's kind of all of the above of everything that you just said. And um I'm so delighted that you have been called to um, to read the book. So thank you for that. Um, what's so interesting is that there there definitely can be a dance um, where I'm leading and other times where she's leading. Um, and there also have been times when, um, I have left her um, and uh, yeah, I, 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 I want to share because I think that that's really important. Um, you know, she came into my life like a steamroller and everything changed. And, you know, I share, shared a lot of that um, about how my identity and so much of my life, my daily in and out, as well as, you know, the, the overarching sort of expanse of my life shifted. Um, and, and during that time, it was also sometimes very challenging to be with her. Um, when I first uh, moved, she kept, when I first moved to Asheville, I should say, she kept telling me, right now, I'm teaching you the teachings under the teachings. And your next book will be the teachings under the teachings. And I can't tell you I, I, how many times I sat down trying to write the next book. And it was like, the joke's on you, honey, you're going through it right now. <laughs> you can't write the next book yet. You are in massive initiation. Um, and through that initiation, sometimes I sort of left her behind and I forgot her. And I, 
I couldn't feel her. Um, and then there became the longing for her again. And so there was a little bit of a dance and, um, you know, working with her edginess, with her lusciousness and her edginess and her, just her radical <laughs> um, way of, of being the wind breath that pinkens our soul. Um, so it's it's all of those things that you mentioned, and it. Um, I also love that in um, building a relationship with her, as I have over the last three years, which is really a, a relatively very small amount of time, um, but but doing a, a lot of intentional work to to cultivate the alliance that I have with her. Um, Sometimes it's so easy to just drop in. So when you were talking about dancing and feel like feeling just that being filled in that way, um, sometimes it's very easy for me to have that experience and other times not so much. And I think it just kind of depends on um, what I'm moving through and how she's wanting to guide me. And um, yeah. I hope that's thank you helpful. for naming that Wendy because I really experienced that too with the archetype that I've worked with like I was at one stage I'd written Burning Woman danced around the fire with a couple of friends danced around the fire with a hundred women in America naked all of that and then life happened and she and I split ways because I couldn't hold her fire in me because everything was crashing down and I was I was in my therapist's um, office and she hadn't seen me before my breakdown. And she said to me, um, there's something that you need to find some kind of, you know, she didn't use the words fire from within, but can you feel that kind of that will to do something that, that, and I was like, no, I don't know what that is. I, I just, I'd be faking it if I kind of tried to find that and do that. And then, I walked out of that room and I was trying to figure out what this thing was I could kind of oomph myself up with and it just suddenly hit me it's burning woman that's what I need to activate within myself again that's what I've lost it's burning woman and I have just you know split paths for a good couple of years and that's the energy I need to call in now and I do know that but these relationships are relationships we, we come together we, we move apart there, there is a constant remembering and forgetting, remembering and forgetting, and each re-meeting, each remembering is almost as rich as the first one because you think, how could I have forgotten? It was right. so real, it was so true, and it went, and now here we are again. So I think that's a really important thing to say because those of us who write about these things for a living, like that experience is fixed in physical form in this book of you and that experience then but you as a human being are constantly shifting and changing as life initiates you and I think that that's one of the things I really want to share and make clear in these book club things is that all of our authors are human beings who are learning and growing and changing and re-experiencing and forgetting and remembering again and again we're not some responsible wisdom who have become enlightened and suddenly figured everything out you know it's really important that people see that we are real humans on real human paths and you know not making it up as we go along but constantly remembering and forgetting yeah. and I think it's very easy to put creative people especially on pedestals and say oh well, they've got it all sorted out I wish I could be like that. well no we're all living it all the time it's just some of us our role is to express that and to share that in different forms right right and to experience the the loss of that I mean there there were times when there was such deep grief and sadness um, of just feeling like I don't know where you are. Like, why, why do I feel like I can't connect to you? And, and that was even when I was remembering that it was a possibility. Um, so yeah, there's just so, there's so much. And I love how you said, you know, it's just, it's a relationship. 
just like all of our other relationships. I just had a really, really creepy experience. I just need to show you. Your screen no, is gone. Oh no. Okay, one second. Uh-oh. I kicked it. Oh no. This is gonna be fun, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you won't let me show you. Um okay. Well, as you were speaking, yes. and you were reading it, I don't know how I get myself back. Mm. There is a plant next to me. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, okay. There's a plant next to me which has pinkish red leaves and uh, petals. Um uh bougainvillea. And um they just fell off, like two flower petals just fell off as you were talking. I have never heard it do that before. I helped them hit, heard them hit the ground. And wow. you were talking, and I was when you were saying that throwing petals at my feet, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> wow. So anyway, petals were thrown, and now you've lost me, but it's okay. <laughs> I love it. Well, I but I also love in some way that we're being shown that we can't always see it, and yet that doesn't <laughs> mean that it's not true, right? Um, yep. Yep. So I'm just trying to restart that, but if I can't, I am still here, and you can still hear me. Yes. So I was wondering if there are no other questions, if um. You I'd would like, like to, to speak, Lucy. Oh, yes. Coco, please. Hello. Hi, 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 hi. Nice. Oh, I've got so much energy coursing through my body <laughs> right now. It's like, I feel like I have questions and have no questions because this has just hit me in such a profound way. Um, especially when you spoke about the part when you were just speaking, of, well, two bits. Um, when you said lay down by the bones of the story and let your bones like resonate with it was just like a crack in my heart and I just started crying because um it really does feel like this thing of being going into the ground with the story and that's how I felt when I read the book there was, mm. I'm getting tingles now in my head. It was just this, I don't know what that is. <laughs> I don't know what the story is. I don't even know what the book is, but it was just such a transmission. I devoured it in one just gulp. And um, because it rang so true for me of my own journey with one, a poem that came, but also a book that I've been <laughs> wanting to write. And when you were speaking about this force that comes, and it's almost like it's not a command, but it is a call, and it's relentless, and it doesn't leave you. But then there are times when it doesn't feel like it's there. And because for me, it's like working you, working the medicine through you. It's like you can't, when you said you can't write because you live in it, you can, and that's how I feel like there's just this journey so you're clarifying so much of this process mm -hmm. that I'm going through because I think as someone said in the chat there's this tendency for me to think oh I've lost the creative flow <laughs> and the force is gone and it's like no she's just working me in another way she's still here and when Lucy was talking about this mother act because that's not my the book is about that's coming wanting to come through this mother but not a mother as we know and I want to cry again because it's like um it does this to me all the time because it's such a force and um an unknown energy <laughs> and that wants to be birthed and um as you're speaking and like when you were saying that it just came to you and it wouldn't let you rest on it. it's like just that sense of these elements of mother that we haven't seen yet or need to be explained in a way and 
just trusting that process. So I think my question is, because you said something about um, through this process, you really began to recognise yourself as a, a medium. Um, and I kind of want to understand that because it's, it's like I know something's channeling through me, but I don't exactly know what I'm doing, if that makes sense. Oh, but when you use the word medium, it was like, oh, I am a channel for this and I am a medium. And it is a medium thing that's coming through me. So it's just, I wanted you to speak into that. Um, mm. So I could kind of, yeah, embody that as a, like a truth for myself. Mm -hmm. That's possible. Oh my gosh, thank you for all of the things that you shared. I'm so, I'm so touched. And I do think that it's so important for us to remember that part of the creative process is, doesn't look like we're producing anything. We're, we're living everything. You know, that is part of the creative process. Resting, death is part of the creative process. Um, so I really want to honor that. Um, um, gosh. So, um, I'm aware that the shamanic practitioner in me is the one who's wanting to step forward and talk about mediumship. Um, it's such a beautiful gift. And it carries with it great responsibility, as well as um, really, um, well, just to put it simply, that you take exquisite care of yourself. You take exquisite care of your vessel, of your yeah. physical vessel, um, of your heart, and of your mind. and um and your boundaries and um to have a mediumship um gifts um sometimes the faucet can be on like full blast mm. and that can be really intense and as a sovereign being you have the total and absolute um uh, well, sovereignty to say, I'm going to tight trade this down. Like you guys need to slow it down <laughs> and do whatever it is that you need to do in the way that it works for you to say, like, I need to sleep right now. Like, I get that you want to bring all kinds of things through and that's great. And like, I also am in a human body and I need to take care of the human body. Um, and so for some reason, that just feels really important to share with you, because I think that sometimes, I mean, I certainly had to learn like, oh, just because it's available to me doesn't mean that I don't have any say over how it's coming through and how I choose to be in relationship with my helping spirits or any, you know, any ways that I'm working with mediumship. Um, and then the other piece is when you're sitting down to write, when you're sitting down to, to bring through um, this gorgeous relationship that you have, you know, you can also say, okay, I'm so ready and willing, you know, to receive, let's go help me learn how to do this with you. And, um, mm. and I think too, um, you know, it might be that you'd like to have someone support you in that. Um, um, and that could be really helpful too, um, to have a shamanic practitioner or anyone who has experience um, with those qualities and skills and gifts to help you be in both worlds, 
because being in ordinary reality and being in non-ordinary reality in the sense that you're bringing things through, you know, this is, it's, it's a big responsibility. And it's mm-hmm. also, as I said, goes back to you really getting to tend to yourself and your heart and your spirit and your gifts and what you came here to share with all of us. Um, yeah, so we really need you in your best possible, you know, configuration <laughs> so that you can be doing your life in the way that you long to do your life. Is that helpful? Did I answer? I feel like I went off on a tangent, maybe. <laughs> you answered a lot, but maybe not specifically what I was asked because it was more in, re- in relation to the mistress herself as in um because as soon as I tap into that energy it is like a thought as she saw it's just like a and I just want to cry all the time so it's almost like but what I'm understanding from what you said is that it is a relationship and I think I've just been seeing it as a one-way flow Mm -hmm. through me without feeding back of how I'm actually receiving this and how it kind of feels like it's like overtaking and like being in relationship to it rather than um just allowing this force to come if that makes sense yeah it absolutely makes sense yeah 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 I mean I'm going to need to stop the Q&A at this point otherwise we're going to run out of time and I do like to respect time boundaries as much as possible um i don't want to put you under pressure wendy to do ritual in short time so it's up to you to feel into you know we we can do five minutes more if that's enough and if it's not um that's also fine um yeah i mean i i think that i can I think that I can offer that. And I think what I'd like to do is just go in and actually talk to the mistress for a moment um, and just check in with her. I actually do have a little um, bowl of some rose petals. I always have rose petals, you guys. <laughs> As <laughs> yes, perfect. Um, and the, the last line of leave rose petals at the gate, I will come. Um, it's, you know, this is a beautiful practice and there are so many ways you don't have to have the actual, you don't have to have rose petals. So if I may, I would just like to rattle just for a second and just check in with the mistress really quickly. Is that okay? Mm-hmm. So the mistress is recommending that um, after our call, this is a little ritual that you could do for yourself anytime and you could do it as often as you wish, but she's actually inviting you to um, just create a sacred space for yourself, 10, 15 minutes, um, maybe less, maybe more, whatever feels right for you, where you won't be disturbed. and light a candle or just lie down and bring to mind in whatever way you can a rose. And she's um, inviting you to actually step into the rose and to step into the rose as if you're stepping into a room or a garden and explore what the rose has to offer for you. She's um, also sharing that just us being together today in this way is to her leaving rose petals at the gate. Um, That she already has her own distinct relationship and knowing of each of you. And um, so she's just wanting to honor you by gifting you um, rose petals and inviting you into the medicine of the rose and just seeing, you know, what is, what is there for you? What gift is there for you? 
And you could take a question into the rows with you if you would like to, or you could just simply go in and say, what would you, what would you have me know right now? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Wendy, for the gift of your time and your energy and your words and for bringing the mistress into each of our lives and bringing her here tonight with you and reminding us of her in our lives right now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all for your presence. Um, these are so special to me. They really are. Um, it means so much to see each of your faces and just to sit here with you for an hour is just so special. Our next one is going to be um, January the 19th, which is a Thursday, and it is going to be um, Alice Grist, Dirty and Divine. So we will be doing tarot cards. She is our tarot queen, <laughs> and I'm hoping she might um, read a few cards for us as well as really diving deep into the practice of tarot for everyday living, which is, is how she does it. Um, sign up will open on Monday. Um, rather than tomorrow, because tomorrow <laughs> is pre-orders opening for Sarah Robinson's new book, Enchanted Journeys. So that is very exciting and we will be very busy tomorrow. But hopefully I will get Lee to send you out the link to this in case you wanted to rewatch it or if you missed a bit. Um, feel free to share the recording with anybody who, who you want and all of the recordings um, are going up onto YouTube so that people can access them at any time that they want to. Um, mm. So um, that is all I have to remember to say. Yes, so go well. Thank you very much. And until next time, I will see you then. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.